Welcome back. Please silence your phones. We now pick up the scenario three weeks later at the third meeting of the board on November 29th, 2019. Thank you all for reconvening at short notice. We need to present to this board a serious new issue related to the economic fallout that is accruing over the pandemic. <clears throat> Let's start by getting the latest numbers and distribution from Dr. Rivers. The CAPS pandemic continues to grow with more than 1 million cases and an estimated 73,000 deaths worldwide. There are, these are only estimates because many countries are having trouble keeping up with surveillance and laboratory testing. Our models are showing that with this continued rate of spread, there may be five and a half million cases and almost 350,000 deaths in one month. The three month projection is alarming with potential for over 30 million cases and three million deaths. The Americas are still the most severely affected, but there are large outbreaks occurring in many countries across the globe. Countries with limited healthcare infrastructure have seen the highest death rates so far, but healthcare systems in high income countries are also becoming overwhelmed. Financial markets have tumbled with all down significantly for the year. Economic disruptions are being felt across the globe. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. So now let's look at this recent exchange on GNN that focused on the economic and financial crises that are rippling around the world. <laughs> the response to the CAPS pandemic is now the most expensive international emergency ever. Political leaders around the globe are faced with many impossible dilemmas, including financial. We have two guests today to discuss the bottom line of catastrophic response. First up is economist Dave Gamble. Are we out of money? The best way to answer that is no, we are not out of money yet. But the fact is we are trending in a dangerous direction and something needs to change. You have been quite vocal about that and generated some controversy along the way. Well, look, you know me, I try to avoid controversy. But come on, common sense says it shouldn't be controversial to suggest our response should prioritize both lives and livelihoods. Absolutely, we need to save lives. We all know someone who's been affected by caps. But we literally cannot afford a heavy-handed response that suffocates our economy. Pragmatism is a wise choice. I mean, what exactly are the risks and benefits of slowing air travel, of staying home from work, closing schools? disrupting supply chains, interfering with our reliable channels of communication and news. Sure, some of these steps can help slow caps, but often only marginally and with serious costs. When this is all over, some families, some cities, will have suffered more from our interventions than from caps. No question, there is a lot of suffering. Let me welcome Dr. Juan Perez to this discussion. Is Dr. Gamble wrong? Actually, in a way, we agree. Responders, whether international organizations, governments, or even employers and families, each are weighing risks and benefits. And there is not a one-size-fits-all approach as there are different appetites for risk. What I will say, in my mind, our response should aim to protect every life we can. Of course it should be. But let's be frank, letting the global economy slow to a halt puts lives at risk. Yes. Yes, but there does need to be a balance. Okay, you both agree balance is paramount. Theoretically, that's an easy choice, but leaders are now faced with very real and very tough decisions. Just last week, traditional sources for emergency funding had exceeded their limits. As new mechanisms are being discussed, there is consideration as whether funds should primarily support health emergency response or prop up economies. Precisely. And we do need these funds sooner rather than later. Funding shortfalls are putting lives at risk and extending this devastating crisis. Again, we seem to agree. We cannot shortchange the health response, but I suspect we disagree when I suggest that some of these funds are best used to save jobs and critical industries. National leaders certainly have this on top of their minds during the ongoing debates. Look, I am not an economist or a politician for that matter, but as a physician, I am comfortable saying that our health response to CAPS cannot afford to wait for an incredibly complex debate about what sounds to me like history's most expensive economic bailout. Thank you both, and we will be watching and listening for the outcome of these vital discussions. And certainly, the market is eagerly watching for any signs of hope. 
Okay, to go deeper on this, Dr. Eric Toner from our team is going to give details about the financial situation. Thank you. The economic impacts are being felt in all countries. In fact, losses are greater in the wealthier countries despite having fewer cases. This chart shows economic projections for global per capita GDP. If trends continue, preliminary modeling from leading economists suggests there could be an 11% decline in GDP at the one-year mark into the pandemic and a 25% fall in GDP at the two-year point when after the full effects of the pandemic are felt. There is significant uncertainty about how quickly GDP would recover, but economists fear that the pandemic could push the world into a prolonged period of significantly slower growth. Unlike recessions due to normal business cycles and market forces, a recession caused by a severe pandemic would be unprecedented in the modern age because of the huge loss of both workers and customers. The closest parallel, parallel may be the Great Depression, but the anticipated global recession due to the CAPS pandemic could be much deeper and it could take much longer to recover. There are a number of places where financial resources could be helpful in reducing the economic impact, including public health and medical response, helping national economies and supporting struggling businesses. But there are a lot of needs and there's not enough money to go around. Two organizations that provide loans regularly, the World Bank and IMF, would not have enough money to get us out of this crisis. The World Bank and IMF together disperse about $185 billion per year in funds. And they've already distributed a substantial portion of that money in this crisis. Experts estimate that it would take $400 billion just to bolster the overwhelmed healthcare systems in low to middle income countries, and alone just to uh, cope with the pandemic. To put this in perspective, the financial bailouts of Greece, Portugal, and Ireland following the European debt crisis amounted to approximately $350 billion, and that was only three countries. Without bailouts for national economies, economic failure in the most desperate countries could lead to collapse of national governments, which could further exacerbate the CAPS pandemic. Of course, funds are still needed to support pandemic response. In addition, there are concerns that if some highly important companies or industries fail, there could be a domino effect that undermines the already faltering economy. Many countries in the greatest need of financial support have historically been labeled as risky investments due to a combination of economic, social, and political instability. They would be at even higher risk of default now. Very rough estimates are that collectively donors, countries, foundations, international organizations may have as much as $100 billion to lend or donate over the coming year in this crisis. The question is, what is the strategy for the don what should the strategy for the donors be? This will require a huge and unprecedented mobilization of funds from many different sources. Toner, so the policy question for this board now is how should financial resources be prioritized? Experts are discussing a number of options. The first option is to direct funds to public health and healthcare systems directly in countries that are struggling to, to keep those systems functioning in face of the pandemic. Another option would be to use funds for pandemic response to give to companies that are doing work directly related to the response, either in the making of vaccines or pharmaceuticals, medicines, N95 masks, or others directly involved in the response. A third priority would be to direct funds towards stabilizing governments that are beginning to falter in the face of pandemics. And yet another could be to direct funds towards industries or companies that might take down the global economy in some way, in some kind of domino effect, or in some way, companies that are too big to fail. So the question here is, are there nodes that we cannot allow to fail? What is your sense of priorities? We don't have money to pay for all of these urgent problems. Let me start. Jane. Um, we need to be really clear. Unless we bring this pandemic under control, um, at the end of the day, the question of the economy is redundant. So prioritising what we need to spend 
where we need to spend it to actually get the public health interventions. And that includes the supply chain for PPE and pharmaceuticals, it seems to me is the thing we need to focus on. In truth, and I note the comment that the impact economically on developed countries has been greater than low to middle income countries, that is what has happened previously. This is not unusual. We accept that. And in truth, those developed economies, they do have still a capacity to borrow on the markets. And while some countries are very determined about uh, having surplus budgets, there are times when you dip into uh, your reserves and you know, sometimes run a deficit. So I don't think we should be prioritising and stepping into the role that domestic governments, particularly where there are competent governments in place, uh, but we certainly should prioritise bringing the pandemic itself under control. And, and I agree, and I, I need to add from our constituency that um, you know, we, we need help. We need uh, public <coughs> funding to be able to expand the capacity of our antiretrovirals. Without that, we cannot meet the demand. Okay. Other comments? Yeah, Tim. Yeah, I, I really think there are two questions here. Is one is how to find more money, and then how to best allocate that money. And, and um, on finding more money, I go back to the suggestion of G20 finance ministers, because I think it's, it's that perspective that's needed to understand where those pools are, both nationally and internationally. Uh, David Malpass, the president of the World Bank, uh, makes a big point that there are $15 trillion sitting in zero or negative interest rate um, <coughs> settings at the moment. Um, the, those who are proprietaries, proprietors of those monies might be interested in um, uh, using some of them. Um, if it's f uh, half a trillion, that's a, a small portion of them, significant but small, but if that was going to stabilize or have the chance of stabilizing things such that there isn't uh, a massive uh, contraction of the global economy, then that might be a, a reasonable value proposition uh, to put to that group. Secondly, what are the contingency capabilities of national governments? And this is an area that we found um, is um, universally lacking, uh, which is that ability to surge finance and, and uh, some countries, because they've been hit multiple times by crises, have developed surge capacity, but many still have no ability for surge capacity. So this would be another one where you could look at national efforts to, to mobilize resources. Again, as Jane said, uh, borrowing in the near term uh, may, may buffer in the, in the longer term. And then into the issue of allocation, I think that these are the right things, but I think we have a, um, an ability to draw, or it would be better informed if we have evidence on where value for money is. Where are the investments that would actually make a difference? Because there is a bit of a problem in these settings, uh, which is uh, people see a gravy train, and everybody says they need a billion dollars. Uh, and then you look at the implementation capability of some of those institutions or what it is they're doing, and is there real evidence to support that those things, in fact, would be um, value added? So I think some discipline with respect to where value for money might be got along those various axes would be helpful. And when you say value, you mean value <coughs> to what end? Value to the ending of the pandemic? That's right, okay. as one, or sustaining, um, sustaining the livelihoods, because you do have, I think, this, this tension is a healthy tension, right? If you, if you neglect the livelihoods, then it's going to come back and exacerbate um, the health crisis. So you'll have the indirect health crisis, which is what we saw in West Africa, that many more people were affected by the closure of health facilities and the shutdown of the economy and the falling of screens like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pandemic. <laughs> Part of the yeah. pandemic. Yes, George. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, we already discussed about the coordination and centralized efforts. So we think about you know, the system in China. It's good for the public health, actually. So um, even a good example for the West um, African outbreak of two, uh, 2014 for the Ebola, and also the 2009 pandemic H101. So obviously for when you centralize the fund from the government, you know, for example, so in China we, are, we very quickly, we got enough fund for, to develop a new kind of uh, vaccine for H101. So with 89 days, 89 days, we got a new vaccine available. I mean for <coughs> 21, uh, the 2014 effort to West Af Africa. 
So I was in the team. So we went there with your, you know, one and a half month, we made a decision, we went there. So again, for all this, when you are talking about a prioritize the fund, definitely you need a centralized and coordinated effort. Otherwise, you know, the money will disperse somewhere. So you, you, could, you would envision a, some kind of centralized Centralized in the UN system? Are you thinking? No, I'm not saying the system kind of because system? we are now we are we are in a you know we are in a risk for mm -hmm. pandemic, right? So I'm not seeing the centralized system, centralized effort. You, okay. you, you have to take, take my effort. word. So at the moment we want the funds, right? You need the money. So where's the money? So government can supply some money. A lot of you know private sectors. You know some are sitting here. You have some money, but now you need a really coordinated. Centralized efforts. <coughs> Their comments. Yeah, Toya. Um, and <coughs> piggybacking on to what he just said, um, hotels will be, will be experiencing you know crippling losses during that. And we know that the hotel business in itself makes up 5% of the GDP. And with that being said, we also have to make account for that when we're, when we're trying to increase funding and look for <coughs> extra ways to financially um, commit to this endeavor that we're on to find a vaccine and to provide resources to, you know, all of our constituents, so. Thank you. Yeah, comments here. I think it's important to recognize <clears throat> that this really is an unprecedented situation and we need to be willing, governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective or, for the most part, it's it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on, um, and massive mobilization of resources is appropriate to stem the tide of this of this event. So, when you say things that they haven't been doing <laughs> in the past, you're talking about financial mobilization Correct. in this case. Okay, Brad. Uh, I wouldn't under we shouldn't underestimate the uh, power of entrepreneurship. And um, 2008, we saw the GDP go, GDP go down about six and a half percent. I'm not trying to mitigate what the, what the crisis is happening here, but it's it, we can we have time, a little bit of time here. And so, um, the power of entrepreneurs coming um, right now. Most of our per personal protection devices are manufactured in just a few countries. Um, they used to be manufactured in a much broader base around the world. That can happen fairly quickly. Um, we're already seeing. Um, things move from different parts of the country to different parts of the world now, and, and we need to escalate that, whether it's through, you know, the governments um, helping with tax breaks or, you know, subsidies of that nature to, to, to increase manufacturing of those types of products. It can happen quickly. A Marshall-type plan, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that exactly, but a Marshall plan mm -hmm. that can go into effect uh, can stimulate a change very quickly. Okay, thank you. A couple comments here and I'll come back. Yeah. I, I fully Martin. support Steve what he said. I mean, <laughs> this is a new dimension for everybody and we, we have to think out of the box, if I'm allowed to say it that easy. Uh, we have to use the international measures that we have, like the World Bank and the IMF, but we also have to be ready a national to, to deal with this. And Jane, I agree fully with you. The main focus should be to somehow get this pandemic under control. If we don't progress on this, what is left? after all, honestly to say, and speaking from my industry, I mean, reality in a situation like this, many of our competitors would have been gone for the time being. They will be on ground. They will not be able to continue business. And also a major group like Lufthansa Group will be heavily affected and we depend on uh, governmental support now to be ready for a time after this. I mean, uh, we all hope we get through this and we have to be ready on limited resources to come back in business uh, all around the globe with all our industries. So are, are the airline industries, would you consider them in some ways industries that we can't let fail? Some of them I would support. I mean, uh, otherwise the entire system breaks apart, falls apart. And uh, still in the period where we are in the high pandemic crisis situation, we still need transportation, we still need logistics uh, with other partners, and even for the time after this, there should be a basic service available, otherwise uh, we can get back. Eduardo, did you want to comment? Well, I think, uh, I would like to think that we're too big to fail or let fail, uh, but uh, I do believe that you need to keep uh, the supply chains open for the containment and prevention and mm. amelioration. Uh, we are not, I believe, at the risk of the travel or hospitality industries because you still need that backbone. 
uh, for logistics and supply chain. <coughs> Yeah, um, so I've, I've got information that um, uh, this too big to fail is now moving into the financial sector and uh, reinsurance companies in, in wherever they are operating might be in risk of bankruptcy. So the question then is, as a regulator or as a central bank, what then do we do? Uh, so the question here, I think, is about getting uh, the rest of the financial sector. So it's obvious that the stress test that we have implemented over the years hasn't worked very well. Oh, this is a case which is really beyond what has been um, expected. So for the ones that are failing, I think you need to step in because if you don't step in, then what's going to happen is you, you're probably going to get a systemic failure across the financial institutions. So we need to give confidence to the market. And, and you know, <coughs> once the event is over, then to go back and review the models again. Can I just ask you to say what, and what is the implication if the reinsurance companies aren't able to operate? Does that worry you? Yeah, definitely, you know, because um, uh, this is a global market. So if the one reinsurer falls in one country, what does it mean across the globe that it's occupying in? And one of the, the issues here is then, um, does that reinsurer pull back all its funds to the head office? Okay. And then the other countries then have an issue. Avril? Thanks. So I've been told that some governments have now fallen and that others are teetering and that there's widespread social unrest and governments are asking for emergency aid to stabilize their economies. And I think this highlights, from my perspective, there's the existing need for funding that relates to essentially the stabilization of government so that they can continue to provide services, which frankly still contributes to the point that Jane made, which is that we need to prioritize bringing the pandemic under control. And if those governments fail, that will actually make it much harder for us to do that as we're moving forward. I think um, in addition to that, there's likely to be significant amounts of um, other forms of security unrest, essentially, that can be concerning. And that can come in the form of, uh, you know, terrorist groups or others taking advantage of the situation, but it can also come in the form of you know, famines because of the fact that there are no longer people who are supposed to be providing food <clears throat> in the chain there because of you know, disease outbreaks in an area or things along those lines. And so I think there's a, a need to focus on assistance, humanitarian assistance, other types of assistance that can help to prevent sort of widespread death and destruction in certain areas where we see it and where it's actually gonna make it more challenging in particular to address the pandemic as it continues. But there's also the need, from my perspective, to be looking for the next few months. If we still mm -hmm. believe that a vaccine is not going to be available for many, many months to come, then we're gonna to continue to see a trajectory of an expansion of this. And, um, and as a consequence, we're going to want to be able to make sure that we actually have the infrastructure in place to deliver the kind of assistance that we need in these different areas across the board so that we can actually continue to manage the situation, not just economically, but political instability and violence that might outbreak as a consequence as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jane, and then we'll come right around here. My staff have <coughs> rightly reminded me that, uh, particularly depending on the kind of finance mechanisms that you put in place, there will be issues for particularly low to middle income countries, concerns based on history uh, about what that implies for those countries going forward. So I think um, the search for liquidity and the search for financing mechanisms that give people collectively confidence and acknowledging that uh, governments that are uh, instable or uh, are politically vulnerable will find that even difficult to participate in the conversation. Mm -hmm. I do think the engagement of um, finance ministers and the big global mechanisms, but including the private sector and the banks, will be important. When we went through the GFC, it did require a very significant collective effort to maintain liquidity and to actually keep some of our big financial institutions afloat. <coughs> this would be the same. And if this is the rolling new normal, <coughs> sometimes delaying spread uh, so you can actually keep confidence mm. in your institutions mm. and keep your economy moving, albeit at a sluggish rate, mm -hmm. will be a really important part of uh, the agenda, I think. Sophia? Thank you. And uh, just an update that uh, UN leadership has uh, now put out a statement that it views the health and hum the, this pandemic as a health and uh, humanitarian crisis. And I note the point that Tim was uh, saying earlier about the healthy tension between lives and livelihood um, and that it, uh, the 
UN agencies are now calling for uh, the establishment of a pandemic-related trust fund uh, and calling for contributions. I wanted to say that if we're now heading into the situation where governments are falling and you're having political instability, that if you end up then going into the other spectrum of conflict, then it, that's also going to compound the effects and also much more costly in, in the response. Chris? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, a couple of points to make. I think you know, this is going to take unprecedented uh, effort to raise additional resources, but I think what resources we have have to prioritize public health. It's a little bit like first aid. You have to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. A month ago, we predicted there might be another million cases. That came true. If these projections are true, if there are 32 million cases in three months, the need for governments, industries, companies is going to outstrip any possibility of our, our mobilizing the resources. We can't keep up with the shape of that curve. So we have to stop this pandemic. And that's where we put our first amount of money. What, what do we have to do to make sure we're doing everything we can to stop the growth of this pandemic? Then, assuming there's some resources left over, we have to think about who are our critical partners. And you know, our, the companies that will be our best partners of this are the companies who have been thinking about this ahead of time, who were prepared, who had redundancies in the, and plans for their, for their supply chains. They're going to be our strongest partners. So we are going to have to help work through public-private partnerships to support companies, but not all companies. The ones that are critical to sustaining that global supply chain, keeping commodities, people, food, um, other essential uh, uh, things to, to sustain the stability that we need to prevent governments from faltering, et cetera. So we're going to need much more specific information, and we're going to need a lot of that information to come from the industry itself. And to, I think a complicating sorry. factor, I think, that oh, goes to advancing understanding in the public marketplace also is impacted by the fact that the investor community is not discerning properly from misinformation and disinformation. Um, and so to your point about public-private, it also is incumbent I think, to ensure that everybody's advancing <coughs> genuine understanding of the spread of the epidemic and the efforts being made to mitigate it because the investment community needs to be a part of this as well in terms of their, the role they play in the financial markets. Tim and then Hosti. Two points. First, uh, our country directors at the World Bank are sort of reporting in that there's quite a bit of unethical activity with respect to tying emergency <coughs> loans on a bilateral basis to longer term conditions related to access to natural resources in low income countries, which could indeed compromise the economic viability of these countries moving forward. So there is an issue related to making sure that the emergency doesn't um, uh, facilitate uh, worst practice or unethical practice in terms of financing. Um, secondly, um, I think part of what uh, will s uh, stimulate the mobilization of resources is not only having a sense of the cost, but what the return on investment would be if we actually made it over this. And so I think one critical piece is we need to project out uh, recognizing various scenarios of, uh, of when we're going to get on top of this. The, the world's population is finite. Uh, we know it's, it's doubling uh, you know, at, at this rate, exponential. We'll get to global coverage of, uh, <laughs> of this soon enough uh, with a, some sense of cost scenario. And if we could project what a sufficient investment in best buys would get us in terms of uh, minimizing not only the cost going into this, but also the accelerated uptake of the uh, recovery, then I think that would be helpful in getting investor confidence. Is that something the World Bank could do, this kind of projection, or is that going to require... <clears throat> we we do even this with uh, incredible scientific accuracy, to 0.001%. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. like, so, yes, it is the sort of thing that the bank could do, um, and, and, and really for focusing on projecting to that medium term um, set of outcomes where you can begin to look at the ROI. Hasty. I think as we talk about prioritization of funding, as someone who worked in a hospital before during, before, um, during the Ebola crisis, when so much of the funding for the hospitals go towards combating this specific disease, we can't forget that there are going to be mm -hmm. patients that are impacted by other diseases who would have otherwise lived, received the care they needed, they would be in the ICUs that they need to be in, and with those hospitals inundated with these specific patient cases, we can't forget to help them, first and foremost, to be able to stop not just this disease, but all the others that are impacting patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the comments. Yeah, Adrian and then Steve. So, so I think, first of all, you know, if you think about three, three broad buckets, perhaps. <clears throat> first of all, we have to accelerate shutting down this current outbreak. The second is we have to prioritize industries that allow us to bounce back. But there's the third piece, which is how we, there's 200 epidemics a year. So how many times can we continue to respond to an outbreak? So how are we prioritizing investments in preventing this from happening again, having a faster emergency response, having better data, having better systems to isolate, quarantine, and control? Steve? I think that there's a risk that we assume that our interventions are going to be more effective on the health side than they really will be. So I think there's a need really to be honest with ourselves about what we're able to accomplish. Um, having said that, um, I think that prioritizing resources to the health and public health response is going to be very important, and my staff tells me that those resources are running very low. That uh, prioritization is an important element in sustaining the trust of the population in the system that they're living under, and in a lot of ways that has to be a, a high priority to try to track that and make sure that uh, public trust doesn't erode any further than it already has. Yeah, Tim. Very quickly on this point, I, I think um, the financial resource may be most limited by the human resource. And, and we, I don't think we've moved far enough, fast enough um, um, in recognizing the need for a global surge capacity with respect to uh, multi-purpose workers um, uh, that could be deployed in this setting um, that are required, um, uh, have the competencies and can plug into the system in ways that um, there's no way existing staff uh, could manage all of the, all of the challenges. So I, I just think that uh, we really need to put some, some serious thinking about what that surge workforce capacity looks like. What are the set of competencies? Where, do they, where can they get plugged in and really be additional in a setting like this? So uh, just to add kind of a focus back on the, the last question here as well, a number of people have talked about critical nodes or industries that we can't let fail or that are critical to our survival through this or an economic survival. <clears throat> are there things that we haven't talked about that should be surfaced, nodes that we shouldn't? I think to echo what he said, um, you look at Marriott International and you think hotels, but they are diversified in many different fields. Um, many people do not know that we have a whole healthcare team across the world that of, of nurses, doctors, and nurse practitioners. So when he says mobilization and uh, getting other healthcare providers to jump in to help with the situation, you can use private sector uh, companies that are diversified in many different areas to help utilize and you know really get into the groundwork of what needs to be done to get this accomplished. Okay. Last moment for comments. Well, I think we should acknowledge that since the start of the pandemic, one of our members has succumbed to the disease. Um, and I note that uh, Dr. Chikwe, who was a very upstanding member of this committee, sadly is not with us today because he is fighting the disease. Thank you. Yes. So um, is there any priority that's on this list before we close, any priority that we have not talked about that you think should be amongst those that should be receiving global priority for, for donors financing? Stabilize the faltering government. I want to add uh, one more comment that like Sophia said, you know, government is 40. We cannot afford a 40 government. <laughs> We got to make sure we need a strong <laughs> government here. This is a, you know, with the point we should address. Mm -hmm. And I, f I agree with Timothy, we come to a status now where we have to stabilize the resources that we have anyway. Uh, if it really falls apart in <coughs> any sector, uh, we will have f f resources all around the globe, but how to get them where we want them, how to work them together, how to exchange them. Uh, it's mm -hmm. beyond borders of companies, of countries, mm -hmm. in that status that we are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, final comment, Tim? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Avril? But, but something that I mentioned earlier, too, that's not up there, I think, which is basically um, ensuring that we actually have on the list of things that would receive mm -hmm. funding, infrastructure that would allow for both public and private sector help for humanitarian assistance that would then actually help to provide 
um, to address the challenges that are exacerbating the, uh, you know, the spread of the disease under certain circumstances. Got it. Yeah, real, real quick, I it may be inherent in the prop up of industry, but uh, trade associations should be added to that. There's some really effective trade associations today, Haida being one of them, and it's bringing manufacturers and distributors together. Uh, Henry Schein's part of it, BD, Johnson & Johnson, 3M, that are uh, very effective in, 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 collaborating. in collaboration, um, and just should be, we should make sure we're enabling and, and empowering them. Okay, Tim, very quickly, uh, it's not just about allocation, it's about accountability. If you get money out quickly, you've got to get re accounts in quickly. We still don't have that capacity, and without it, you don't have confidence that the money's being well spent. And, and can I add one? And that is, notwithstanding the fact that everyone is very stretched, one of the things we always need to do is to learn from the circumstances that we're in. So if we don't use this circumstance to collect data, actually do an analytical uh, sort of check, if you like, which for future circumstances we can then rely on in terms of preparedness, we will also be missing something we should be focused on. Okay. Chris. Tom, one, one other area, it's a modest amount of, of resource in, in the context, but also one of the things we've been doing since the start of this uh, pandemic is actually increasing some of our focus on, on the cutting edge science and research and development. Um, this is an unknown pathogen. We're, we live in a, in a period of, of amazing scientific discovery uh, that may not have been focused on coronavirus. So mm -hmm. we're putting some of our philanthropic resources into cutting edge research on getting countermeasures faster, trying to accelerate that one year to a vaccine, trying to reduce the cost because even though the numbers don't currently reflect it, given the pattern, we're going to see lots of cases in some very poor countries. Mm -hmm. And so getting the cost of commodities down, getting additional uh, manufacturing capability and trying to harness the cutting edge of science and technology and maybe help end this pandemic. Thanks. And Steve, true last word. The, uh, what we're doing here is really a larger version of what we did in the last move. And I would hope that the systems that were put in place to determine how to share the medical resources would be able to operate at this level as well, that they'd be scalable. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all for this discussion. We'll bring these recommendations forward and we will close this meeting and reconvene as needed.